So, hi, um, I'm Lucy Walker, I'm on the Committee of the Neurology Society. Um, thanks everyone for turning up. We haven't had so many back in person, so um, it's nice to be back. And um, Fiona here, the computer Fiona Chiston, when she first contacted us, we were kind of going, uh, we were just starting going back in person. But then, in fact, most of the committee went down in COVID, with COVID, so we had to cancel. So this is, um, we're really, really delighted to be able to fit Fiona in, in August. And um, perhaps not the best month really to talk, but we have a nice turnout tonight, so thank you very much. Um, Fiona now lives in Petersfield, just off the Mill Road, so what better person to give me a talk? And her research sounds absolutely fascinating. Um, I'll obviously let her continue, but what's really nice is that you'd be able to work with local archives as well as going overseas. And the system works, and we've yeah. done better actually than many of the uh, more formal bodies who are looking at the world. That's good. Um, so it's a wonderful, I think it's going to be a wonderful example to us of what can be done. And you've turned it into a very moving and very relevant story which is not only relevant for 100 years ago but relevant for today um, so that's extra special and um, we'll talk listen to fiona who's also going to suggest we look at a few things um, books for sale and also to sign but also i think we'd be happy to take questions absolutely yeah yeah yes yeah. so i'll take questions so we can turn I'll guarantee to answer them but i'll, 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 I'll take <laughs> questions we can turn it into a discussion and um we we have a room for longer and uh, we will sign off at, at the end i'll remind you of our open page which is going to see september okay yeah, okay good to you. thank you first of all um can i check you're picking picking up my mic okay yeah, it's it's on and very should good. I, should I open this? Hmm? Do you think hmm? I should get a bit of air in? No, just in case. Uh, probably yeah. better for the recording oh. to keep it like that. <laughs> Maybe, yeah. So thank you for that introduction. Thank you for coming. So as you said, great to see people out on a on a lovely summer's evening when you could be outside taking the air. But. Um, I was absolutely determined to come and talk to the Mill Road History Society because um, it's one of the groups that um, really helped me feel at home in Cambridge. I came here in uh, 2015, um, and I said I live in Petersfield Ward rather than Rumsey Ward, um, but I hope you'll forgive me for that. And I, um, I had a project, that's all it was to start with. I didn't start out by saying, I'm going to write a book. But I got a windfall inheritance, um, which was the, which was like a sort of, well, it was a windfall from a completely unexpected. About 10 years ago, uh, when I learnt for the first time about the two people who are now on the cover of my book. This print is actually very poor quality in reality, but the book um, designers and typesetters managed to do wonders with colorizing it. So um, that woman there um, standing in a field in front of a cabin um, lived the first 35 years of her life mostly uh, in Cambridge and ended up going to the west coast of, of Canada. And um, the little boy on her right, on her, the left of the picture, you can barely see him in there, he's, he's only about seven years old. Uh, he never married. He lived with his mother most of, uh, well, nearly all of his life. And when he died, uh, he was effectively, he'd been taken into care and um, the Canadian authorities uh, sold his property, uh, which was his mother's property, and um, realised that he had no birth record, for one thing. This can happen in Canada, apparently. Very, very rarely happens in the UK, but it can happen in Canada. So 
Um, they didn't know who his father was. Um, they, didn't, they weren't sure of his true date of birth or anything else. Um, and one thing or another, they had to hire genealogical detectives uh, to try and find out not only where he came from, but also his mother, because, as I will explain, she took steps to sort of change her identity along the way. And it took them 17 years after his death, yes, 17 years, to find me and nine other people who were distantly related through the, in my case, the maternal line to that woman who was born in Cambridge. So, um, I also tonight uh, want to um, help, I want to ask for your help to, to try and uncover the identities of some of uh, the photographs I have taken in late Victorian and Edwardian times, which came into my possession because the Canadian authorities, having taken all this time to sort of close the file, it had to go to the Supreme Court of British Columbia, no less, to, to resolve it. They, um, uh, they had in their filing cabinets, they had things they'd obviously taken from the old man when he died, which included a photograph collection including these photos taken in Cambridge. Some of them I can identify if there's something on the back, but some of them I can guess at, but some of them I don't know who they are. So with my talk tonight, as well as telling you about my, I think, relatively extraordinary story, I also want to um, sort of share with you um, some of the pictures I've brought tonight, because I believe somewhere in Cambridge, there will be at least one of these pictures in somebody's photograph album, and I want to try and find, uh, uh, f find who, the, who these people are, including that lovely looking young woman in that Edwardian outfit. So, back to the story of my distant cousin, Jessie. Um, you will see on the left there, this is one of these Victorian photos, um, taken, I reckon, about 1890. Uh, don't know the studio in this one because it's not on the frame, but, um, uh, the, but she, the woman on the left is uh, the Canadian authorities are sure, and therefore I'm happy to be confident, is a woman called Harriet Rook, who was born in Swaffham Bulbeck, I discovered, and who came into Cambridge, married an ostler. Isn't that a lovely word, an ostler, who looked after horses at, at an inn in Cambridge um, in the sort of mid-Victorian times. By the time this picture was taken, she's in her fifth, early 50s, having been widowed quite young. And somehow, she came into the life of the young girl on the right, who is the same one as the woman in the picture over there. Oh, I can, I can, I can, wait a minute, I've been told there's a little button. Oh, yes. So, that is a woman who was born Jessie Ashpole Heading, and there she is by this time, She's Jessie Underwood, and this woman is Harriet Rook. And I will explain in a minute how Mill Road became a, a part of their journey through life, as it were. So, um, if I go to the next slide. People ask me, well, how are you related to Jessie Heading? How did the, the Canadian authorities make a link between you and Jesse Heading. Well, the link is through this man, William Heading. I've discovered that there are quite a lot of headings in Cambridgeshire and Huntingdonshire and Bedfordshire. Um, it's quite an unusual name in some parts of the country, but there are a lot of headings and they tend to be farming families. Um, 
And William Heading, as you see, was born in Great Gransden in 1813, became a farmer, moved to the old warden area of Bedfordshire. And he is my great-great-grandfather through a maternal line, and he is that woman who you've just seen in... Uh, uh, oh, do, do come in. Um, he is her blood natural grandfather. And uh, this little document on the right is another lovely little thing that came into my possession. I ended up, through the Canadian authorities, just saying to me, do you want this stuff? Because otherwise it's going to go in the dump. I said, yep. So they sent it to me. Um, that is a memorial card. And if you see there, um, thy will be done on the outside and inside the card, in loving memory of William Heading, who died in November 1903, aged 91 years, and is interred in what is called Moorhanger Cemetery, but we call it Moggerhanger now. Um, and he, as I said, was the natural uh, for grandfather of Jesse because the Canadian authorities discovered, and I was able to back this up with my own research, um, one of his daughters was a woman called Mary Ann Heading, who um, was Jesse's mother and had Jesse illegitimately in Sydney Street in Cambridge. Jesse was born in this same terrace where Boots is now. And also, you see the blue plaque there. Uh, I'm sure you've noticed that before. That's Charles Darwin, uh, and when he was a young student, also lived in that terrace, but not at the same time, of course, <laughs> way, way earlier in the 19th century. So um, one of the first things I did was um, I went to uh, a session in Cambridge Library one Saturday morning to try and see if I could find anything more about um, the birth and baptism of uh, Jesse, because the Canadian authorities had not been able to discover Jesse's father, but they had got a birth certificate which didn't name the father, which said she was born in this address in Sydney Street to Mary Anna Heading. And uh, lo and behold, courtesy of the Cambridge uh, Digital Archive, Cambridgeshire Digital Archive, I discovered that Jesse was actually baptised in. Um, all Saints Church, which we all know is an absolutely lovely church. And um, the digitised records of All Saints, um, lo and behold, there was the birth father's name. And I thought, why have I found it? Well, and when the Canadian authorities couldn't, and I realised it was probably because they'd been digitised, whereas they, you know, they, the records had been digitised and they weren't earlier. So the big secret I found was the name of the father, who was called Richard Ashbole Crisp. So Ashbole was his mother's name, and Jesse was, um, was baptised Jesse Ashbole Heading so retained part of the father's identity. But, um, and it was all very strange because I discovered that Richard Ashbold Chris wasn't married. Why he didn't marry Marianne Heading, goodness only knows, your guess is good, good as mine. But it, it did mean that for me, I thought, right, well, she retains this middle name of Ashpole. So somebody thought she should have her father's name but whether she was told the significance of this name, again, buried in the, in, in, the, in the depths of time, as it were, probably we'll never find out. So after that, I thought, well, I found this out. I've only just started now. So as I say, it started as a project. I thought I need, I'd like to do a family history project. So I decided to focus on this young woman born in Cambridge as I was now living in Cambridge and try and find out as much as I could about her life. So um, here is her census record. And you can probably just see the highlighting here. Jesse A for Ashbel, heading. There's the word. 
illegitimate, four years old. So this is the 1881 census. There above is Harriet Rook, that housekeeper that I showed you uh, a picture of earlier, widow, 43 years old. And up here is Ebenezer Canham, and he was described, you can't really read it, but he was described himself, there's the CIG, as a cigar dealer. And where were they living? What is this, an extract of the census from? From Inguida Street, 154 Guida Street. Um, I gather the numbers have changed a bit, so I'm not 100% certain if it's still the same Guida Street. But there they are, and um, that word illegitimate, I sort of thought, oh, really? Is that the way they're going to describe this child in a census? You know, oh, it's not, not ours. You know, it's not our son or daughter. It's illegitimate, you know. And I realised, when I saw that word, I, I thought, hmm, this is really a good project for me because I found out in my 40s that my mother and father weren't married all the time when I was a child. So, technically, I was illegitimate too. I was brought up with my mother and father, but... I had a great affinity with people who are defined as somehow outside the law, illegitimate, which is, so there's Jesse there. And I'm sure you recognize that that's Guida Street on the right-hand side. So it's in that terrace, the house where they lived on the right-hand side. And uh, there we are. And on the left, I'm sure you recognize this is Mill Road Cemetery. And as we know, there are wonderful works being done there to identify the graves and the people there. And so I found Ebenezer Canham's grave. Um, Harriet Rook isn't there, but Ebenezer Canham uh, died not... He certainly didn't survive to the next census. He died, I think, in 1887, I think. So um, by the time Jesse was 10, he was certainly dead. And his wife here, Susan Canham, died in 1880, which is why I assume he took in a housekeeper to look after him and his grown-up son, who was a carpenter. Um, and, uh, and so he did, he did remarry at one stage as well afterwards, you know, I discovered from from someone else who contributed to the, um, to the Mill Road Cemetery website. Um, but there it is. That's on that sort of Norfolk Street side of Mill Road Cemetery. But um, it was a delight, obviously, to find that. And I thought, Ebenezer Canham, isn't that a wonderful Dickensian-sounding name? Um, so he had a very brief role in Jesse's life, but uh, a role he certainly did. So then... I follow these two, and there's the picture again. This, so this picture was taken, I reckon, just before the next census, which is 1891. And I found, I found them, uh, I found Harriet then, um, not in the Mil not in Guida Street anymore, but she was in Vickers Buildings, a place I hadn't heard of. But I found this entry here. I don't know whether anybody recognises it. This is an entry from a Spalding's directory of which the, um, there are a couple of relevant ones in the Cambridge collection at the top of the library. And um, uh, Vickers Buildings, it seemed, was somewhere under Lion Yard. It was demolished. It was one of those areas near Tibbs Row and um, uh, obviously Petit Curie, that sort of area. So in other words, the market area. And this was quite interesting because um, uh, if you look, you know, just take a snapshot of this one small entry in Spalding's directories, and I found it told you an awful lot about uh, the market life at that time. There's somebody who's a dairy woman living there, and then, um, and, and then the next one is an ostler, not the ostler who married Harriet Rock. Then there's a stable keeper, the Cambridge Scientific Instrument Company. That sounds more like the sort of company that would be in Cambridge, doesn't it? And then Dew Smith Albert MA, so a graduate of the university. Then a brewer of the Carrier's Arms, and then Favel Ellis and Son Workshops. 
George Taylor, plumber and glazier, Mrs. Mary Ann Sota, bedmaker. So she was a bedmaker for the students in the college. And there, underneath there, is Vickers Buildings, which there's one thing in common with all those living in Vickers Buildings. They're all women. Which I thought, oh, well, it must have been a lodging house that was deemed respectable for, for, for women to be uh, there. And there were several people in the Vickers buildings who were dressmakers and um, that sort of needlewomen, that sort of uh, occupation. And indeed, by the time of the census in 1891, when uh, Jessie is 14, she's described as a dressmaker's apprentice. She doesn't seem to graduate from this because there's no further reference in her life to dressmaking, at least formally. But she obviously learnt some skill at that time and, of course, had left school already. I think she probably <laughs> did have a few years schooling because she could read and write. Um, so that's 1891. And then we move on to Jessie, still in Cambridge, now an adult, uh, recorded in the 1901 census in this building. I don't know, what, does anybody recognise this building? It's, it's on Silver Street. There's been an awful lot of rebuilding outside it recently. So it's this top end of Silver Street, just round the corner from St Catherine's College. And St Catherine's College now owns this building and it's used as student accommodation. And that, um, that in the early 20th century, was a dentist's surgery. And Jessie and her adoptive mother, uh, Harriet, uh, lived there and um, once again they were doing housekeeping and domestic duties but at the same time as this Jessie started branching out and becoming a children's nurse what we would call a nanny and as you know an, lots and lots of women were in domestic service at the start of the 20th century so on the right hand side there is something that seems to date from this period, which was also something that came in that box from Canada with the, with the photographs, etc. And it's a birthday book. And uh, so on this side, there's the, the dates and a little sort of homily or uh, text from the Bible. And on the right-hand side are the birthdays inscribed. So if you see the top one actually says Jessie A. Heading, because she was born in January. And underneath there, is a Mrs. Cook, and it says baby born in November um, 1907. So I thought, oh, Jessie's a nanny, a, a children's nurse. She, they're inscribing babies born. So I thought it must, there must be a connection, and maybe there's a connection to the pictures of babies I've also got in the book, which we'll come on to in a minute. So what I did, again, using Cambridge resources, I took all the names and dates in the birthday book, of which there were quite a lot, and tried to find out who these people were. So the Cook's family the, um, work, uh, they were um, quite a prosperous family. They lived on Bridge Street. Uh, and they had quite a lot of, um, of, of servants, you know, cooks, housekeepers, children's nurse, blah, 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 blah. So um, not only Jessie, but also one of um, Harriet's cousins also worked in, in service for Mrs. Cook. Um, and I also found a family called the Drakes, who um, were running the... Uh, a, a store, a big store, close to what is now um, the Hills Road Sixth Form College, and which um, I think, again, there were several references to the book, so I think Jesse probably looked after the children at some stage. So, um, so we're now, obviously, in that Edwardian period. We're now in the early 20th century, but I know that Jesse leaves this very... Um, m modest but settled existence in Cambridge could have been a lot worse uh, she wasn't in extreme poverty or anything like that but she ends up going to Canada why? so um, I will shortly come on to tell you how I found out why she left so 
A small diversion here to go back into these photographs because there are a few uh, laid out here if you want to have a look. But some I could cross-reference with likely candidates in the birthday book. Some, I, a few, I knew to be Jessie herself. But I don't know who this young woman is. Very likely <laughs> uh, either one of Harriet Rook's cousin, um, nieces or just a friend Jessie made in Cambridge. But it's such a striking photo. Maybe she just kept it because it was such a lovely photo, but I think it's more likely that she kept it because it was someone she knew and loved or had some affection for. And then here are these babies and young children. Um, uh, I've got about half a dozen of these, and I, I don't know who they are. And I just feel someone somewhere, they're all sort of around between 1901 and 1910, I reckon. Um, I just am hoping that someone somewhere will say, I recognise that picture. Um, it's of my great granny or whatever. Um, so that's how I hope you might, uh, you might be able to help my still ongoing researches. So just to summarise before I take you all to Canada, you probably know all this stuff, but um, I found it really invaluable, um, all the resources that there are in Cambridge. Here's just a few of them, the Capturing Cambridge website, the Cambridge Collection in the library, the Mill Road Cemetery website, um, in my case, St Catherine's College Library. I mean, obviously, um, uh, if you have uh, any family who's got any connection with the Cambridge College, the librarians, in this case, when I, I she was very helpful to me, so um, don't forget that they have libraries and resources too. And also, don't underestimate the power of just talking about this story and, walk, and walking around Cambridge and sort of putting everything together in my mind. So, now we move on to the Canadian resources, of which I didn't have any to start with, but I realised that if I was to try and find out about Jessie's life in Canada, I had got enough confidence after my research in Cambridge to think, well, I'll try and first of all find out what I can get digitally, and then, if I'm fortunate enough, I will go to, to uh, Canada and see some real life resources. So there's a there's excellent uh, websites. They're generally there's a there's a you have to go several layers. There's a sort of the, there's the, the Ontario. There's like the national archive. There's the um, the state archive. So in this case, uh, this um, I mean that record immigration record in Quebec but um, uh, Jessie ends up in Vancouver. So um, the local resources are also are very helpful. Um, but this is something that I, I paid about $5 for, and it was posted to me from, uh, from uh, the immigration record, which I think was kept federally, and um, blow me down. There, in very, it's very bad quality, I know. But believe me, that one there, and I'm going to circle around now, that says Heading Jessie. And um, it obviously tells you which ship she came on, um, which date she arrived, and, um, and also uh, a little bit about some of the people we travelled with. So... Um, the immigration, if you've got any Canadian family, the immigration records for 19th century in particular, not so much after about the Second World War, but because people are still alive and so a lot of those records are, are not, not available. But the, the 19th century and the, uh, and the early 20th century records are terrific. Um, so I wanted to find out a bit more about the period when Jesse left England. So why 1912? It was quite a turbulent period. Um, 
The most personal thing for Jessie was that her adoptive mother died. She died in Addenbrooke's, the old Addenbrooke's, obviously, of a heart condition in April 1912. And Jessie emigrated in November 1912. But also, as we know, on the left-hand side, that is Emmeline Pankhurst. And um, she, she, obviously, uh, she was the leader or obviously the best-known women's suffrage movement. And as, so it was a time of turbulence for women. And it was also a time when people were asking questions about women. Because believe it or not, there was deemed to be a surplus of women in the early 20th century. You know, they didn't know what to do with us all. So, um, uh, so I knew about the suffrage movement, but I didn't know that Jessie might be deemed to be a surplus woman. Um, and of course, what was the other thing we know about 1912? Not about Jessie's expedition, but we know the most famous shipwreck in history happened in April 1912, and that was obviously the, when the Titanic went down. So I also imagined if you were going on a transatlantic journey on your own, and a few months before, thousands of people died on the, what was deemed to be the most modern ship at the time, it might have given you pause, mightn't it, to think, well, do I want to take this risky journey as well? So I realised that has, um, that Jessie might, must have been quite motivated. So going back to that immigration record again, um, I, I discovered uh, that there was lots of sort of little sort of little letters and things on the immigration record that I thought, oh, I don't know what they mean. But one of them was, you can't see it in this section of the record, but one of them was GFS, which stands for Girls Friendly Society. I don't know whether any of you have heard of the Girls Friendly Society. I hadn't heard of it. It's still going, but it had a real heyday in Victorian and Edwardian times. Generally speaking, it was, um, it was something that sort of middle-class women who had servants um, uh, joined at, along with their servants to encourage their servants to do sort of, to improve themselves, I suppose. But also, I didn't realise they had an emigration programme. So that picture of Emmeline Pankhurst was taken in the Women's Library at the LSE, the reading room. Um, it's a wonderful place. Have any of you done any research in the Women's Library or heard of the Women's Library? Believe me, if, you want, if you're interested in that period before the First World War, it's fantastic in particular. But um, it's, a, it's a very, very good resource. And I feel it's probably under-resourced, because under-used, because there's n wasn't, it was beautiful space, but there weren't that many people there when I, I had to sign up as a temporary researcher to use it. And lo and behold, in the Women's Library reading room, there's not only the national records of the Girls Friendly Society, which I ploughed through, but also the Cambridge records. I don't know why they're there, but this is one little leaflet I found. It is a training home for young servants run by the Girls Friendly Society, Ely Diocese Family Lodge. And uh, it's in Two Hills Road, Cambridge, which it's a, still a building, it's an office building now, r very close to the Olem Church. Um, and so I spent several days going through there to try and find Jessie's record, and I found them. Um, I found them in several places. I found a copy of her immigration record there because I realized that she was sponsored by the Girls' Friendly Society as a surplus woman, that phrase was used in their reports. They, they were dealing with surplus women. Um, and if you look, here are a list of members in Cambridge. And blow me down, there I find Heading Jessie. Jessie Heading, along with lots of other young Cambridge women. So that record is about 1910, that sort of period. Um, so I had to go to Canada, didn't I, after all this? I'm not going to tell you the full Canadian story because it would take too long. But um, I had two 
trips to Canada. Uh, the picture on the left is taken in a, a wonderful museum. It's called the Museum of the Atlantic in Halifax, Nova Scotia. And that, uh, that has a whole floor about the Titanic. If you're into the Titanic, the whole floor about, well, of stuff there. But also in Halifax, Nova Scotia, there's um, uh, another archive which I went into as a visitor. I didn't make an appointment or anything, I just turned up. And they found me quite a lot of stuff about the, um, the ship that she'd come on to, uh, more detail about the immigration record, how much money she brought into Canada with her. You wouldn't believe how much sort of texture was available in the, in the archive. And again, I just had to pay a few dollars for a, a photocopy of it. Then on the right, uh, I spent several happy hours here. Um, that is in Vancouver, and that's the Vancouver Public Library, VPL. And that has wonderful digital resources for British Columbia as well, with similar things like street directories, like as I got used to from the Cambridge collection. And um, I was able to find uh, out a surprising amount of, uh, I mean, I had some gaps, which I've still not filled, but I found out quite a bit about where Jessie went when she first came to Canada. As, on her own, as a domestic servant, you're on like a, a you know, a, we have a visa system, of course, even in this day, where you have to say what, work, what your skills are and what, your, what work you're going to do. And so she had to declare she was a children's nurse and that's what she wanted to do in Canada, become a domestic servant. And there was a burgeoning middle class out there anxious to employ um, young British women. So uh, let's say, I'm summarising, I'm not going to tell you the whole story, but um, uh, these three very different pictures uh, show you some areas which I found had links with Jessie's life. Vancouver, which is now a modern metropolis, was much smaller in the uh, even, well, all the time before the Second World War, really. And um, uh, that, that area there is very close to an archive that I used for that specific area. And as you can see, it's close to the airport, it's close to the ferry, it's close to the USA border. So it's now a busy, busy place, but it was essentially an area with rural townships and lots of small rural communities. And that's where Jessie ended up. Having been in Victorian Cambridge, quite different, she ended up uh, in, in this part of Canada. And she eventually marries this man, who is, I told you she became Underwood. She used a different name when she first arrived in Canada. She became Jessie MacDonald for a while, but um, she eventually married, became the housekeeper to this chap, who, uh, there he is, uh, in his working clothes. He was a an early farmer who'd bought a 100-acre plot from the Hudson's Bay Trading Company on the, west on the West Coast. Very fertile land there, did well. And look what he built for himself, a really rather substantial house. I mean, this was taken about 1910. So this is the house where Jessie came to and worked as a housekeeper. George Underwood uh, came originally from the borders area between Scotland and England. There are an awful lot, I'm sure you know, of emigrants from Scotland, Ireland, um, and all over the UK, but Scotland and Ireland were uh, a big source of, of emigrants. And um, finally, I found myself at um, George Underwood's grave, which is in a place called Fort Langley, which is a, a historic cemetery. It's, it's a bit like Mill Road. It's got fascinating history and fascinating people buried there. But there is a plaque on the left, which is her son's plaque that was put up by the Canadian authorities because they needed to give him a decent burial as he got no family. And I am standing on Jessie's grave 
It's an unnamed, unmarked grave, um, which was really rather sad. She lived till the age of 93. She was work, sort of hard working. Uh, she did okay in the sense of she survived, but she didn't make a lot of money. I will tell you, the book tells you quite why her son left a substantial amount of money. So um, here we are, I'm summarising now, getting to the point where you can ask me some questions. So first of all, if you want to see more of my photos, you can see them later here on the desk if you want to have a look at them. There's more of them in a gallery on uh, a website I've recently set up, which is www.fionachesterton.com. So now it's time for questions. I had this box of tricks and I had, I had a, a family tree sent from Canada with lots and lots of redactions on it. It obviously decided data protection meant that I couldn't see a lot of the names. So. <laughs> I'm looking for a light switch. Yeah, I'm just so happy to ask any questions. I've probably left lots of things out, but um, obviously I didn't want to bore you by speaking too long. So, um, <laughs> two here, yeah. Catherine, and then you mentioned uh, both the ship that she went out on, the yeah. and the ship that went out on the ship. Yes. What you didn't mention, well, you didn't mention the name of the ship, uh, but also you didn't like to mention which port she sailed from. Yeah. yeah. This is where, yeah. Where she it, was, it was the port of London. Uh, and it was a ship called the Ionian, which was uh, run by a, a line called the Allen Line, uh, which was very much, you know, sort of plying the trade between the Port of London, but also from Glasgow, quite a lot of ship, and from Liverpool. So Liverpool, Glasgow, Port of London. And the Ionian went via uh, Le Havre. It, it made a first stop in call in France, and quite a few extra passengers uh, got on there, not just French people, but there were even some people from Eastern Europe, and um, and it it had you know well over a thousand people on the ship. Um, sadly, uh, the ship didn't survive the First World War. It was commandeered uh, in for wartime service, and it got sunk by a U-boat uh, eventually. So so again, you know, amazing and, and pluck uh, the name of a ship out of a record and with the wonders of digitised records you can now find so much. You can't find everything but you can find so much. Thank you. Did, thank you. Yeah. Did you, did you find anything out about her natural mother? What happened to her? Yes, yes, I certainly did. Um, poor old Marianne, um, she, she went back to live with her father and she looked after her father. You know the William Heading that I told you was the link yeah. point? And she never married, and um, she, uh, she, she was comfortably off. I mean, they were quite a comfortable farming family. And after her father died, she, uh, she lived with other women of means, I think it said in the record, you know. So she was, yes, uh, she was quite comfortable, but sadly never had any, any more children. And I found out if you, if, you know, I've started to sort of draw comparisons between the experiences of, of illegitimate mom, women and mothers of illegitimate children from that time, Victorian time, with my, you know, my mother's experience and my experience in the 1950s and 60s. But also, uh, I don't know whether uh, any of you watch these programs of Long Lost Family and all the rest of them, but, um, it, there's still a huge appetite for, for people to find their natural mothers. And um, I spoke to one of the reporters who, who has done work in this area recently, and he, 
he told me that even today, there's quite a high correlation between um, uh, people who have babies taken away from them when they're young and who then never have any further children. Be you know, it, because they feel they are bad mothers because they've had their, chi you know, they've had their children taken away. So, no, poor old Mary Ann, she, um, that, she lived a quiet life and, um, uh, but she didn't, she, didn't ha she didn't have any children. Whereas Richard Ashbold Crisp, he yeah. did marry a few years later. He moved from the Bedfordshire area uh, and he's, uh, I found him in the census 10 years later with, I think, three or four natural children, uh, three or four of his own children, uh, obviously lawful, uh, legitimate children. Absolutely not. I, I, I trawled through so much to try and find a link between the Rooks and also Harriet's maiden name uh, uh, was Fromont. Uh, and I tried to find links between her, uh, had she worked for you know, the, uh, the headings. Or I couldn't find any link at all. So as with the book, I tell the story of my investigation. Um, and my own personal story, but also I try and ex tell people very honestly when I'm just guessing what happened, making educated guesses, because sometimes you have to, you know. Quite a, but that's one of the reasons why quite a lot of people um, just go the full hog and make these stories fiction, because they feel they're, you know, they, they can use their imaginations a bit more freely, but I felt I wanted to keep it as a non-fiction book, so I try and be honest with the reader and say, actually, this is just my surmise or what I think is the most likely explanation. But there's some things that, I say, will always remain a mystery. Yes, in fact, cabin on the cover, where he's standing in front of that cabin. Sorry, I can't hear you. The cabin, mm -hmm. the, the, the house that she's standing in front of. Yes. Well, that, 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 what, the cabin? Yeah. The cabin. Is that uh, in Fort Langley? Um, yes, it is. Do you know that area? Yeah, I grew up there. Oh, for goodness <laughs> sake. <laughs> That's wonderful. I know, but it was it would have been quite a contrast to Cambridge even then. Exactly. Well, uh, well met. Thank you so much for coming. No, um, so so George Underwood, you know the big farmhouse. Yes. That was in a little community called Milner, which is now just you know there's a big road that goes between Langley and Fort Langley. A sort of long straight road. I think it was called the Glover Road some years ago. I don't think it's called that anymore. And I caught the bus along that road. Um, so the farm house, which doesn't exist anymore, was demolished. But the f I went to the precise site where the farm was, and it's in this little area called Milner. Very few people living there now. Mm -hmm. But the second house is uh, in what is now Langley Township, and the boy died in the nursing home called Langley Lodge in the sort of, again, sort of centre. Langley's quite a sprawling place, isn't it? But what, what I felt was the centre. <laughs> That's yeah. where he was in the nurse, nursing home. Well, marvellous. I'm sure there's lots of things you could mm -hmm. teach me about the area. And, um, but yes, you've absolutely hit the nail on the head. That's why I show this picture of the, the roads and the motorways and the airports and whatever. It's now you'd go there and just think, this is just a busy Canadian stroke, Canadian city close to the American border. But actually, it was completely different when, when Jesse was there. And there's wonderful descriptions in the old directories to tell you what the area was like as well. So um, you really ought to do some research yourself. You know, you'd find out, you, you'd be amazed how, how much you'd find. Yes. If I heard you right, you weren't the sole beneficiary of this. No, there were ten. Have you approached any of the others? And well, the a, few of, a few of them are my cousins, so I know them. Um, not all my cousins. Because of the laws of intestacy, you take it from 
the date, precise date that the, the person who dies in test dies, and on the level on a family tree, as it were. So actually, my mother was alive when, um, when he, the little boy, William Underwood, as his name was, when he died as an old man, um, my mother was still alive. So it was taken uh, from people on my mother's family who were alive in 1994. And I benefited because, sadly, obviously, my mother had died in the interim period and I was an only child, so I was the beneficiary. So, so uh, I, I'm amazed, you know, because I was just so fascinated by the story. I have to tell you that a few people just think, yeah, OK, nice to have the money. <laughs> you know, I just think, mm. I, I'm just, maybe I'm just curious, but I just found the whole story really, really interesting. Mm -hmm. A few of them I don't know. I, and I told you the family tree, that the, the material I was sent from, from Canada was, there was a lot of it that was redacted because I think they positively did not want me to get in touch with people I didn't know. Um, but I can work out their surnames and they tend to be, well, they're, they're, I mean, I wasn't brought up in Cambridge, I was brought up in Leicester, but they're not in Cambridge. Um, in fact, I think one, I, the Canadian authorities told me one was in Australia, you know, because as you know, lots of peop people over a century move uh, all over the place. So I don't think they would know any more because um, we just happen to be the people still alive uh, a long time later when um, he died, so a long time after the whole story of her going to, to Canada, etc. But... Um, <laughs> Maybe one day someone will approach me and say, I loved, I was reading your book one day and thought, oh, I'd love to meet you. Maybe it will happen, I don't know. I know. Did you say that George Underwood, who she is a housekeeper yeah. to, and then married, then was, yeah. and he, bought, he bought 100 acres? Yeah, from the Hudson's Bay Trading Company. And Again, you, yes, I'm looking at you. Yeah. You know this as well. And Fort Langley was founded by the Hudson's Bay Trading Company and, the, uh, you know, when it was Wild West time, you know, yeah. really. So, so the question I wanted to ask, because of, um, in fact, Australian friends, was he the first European to break the land? Do you know? Um, yes. Well, you sort of, yes. No, no. In that the Hudson's Bay Trading Company they started off literally in a fort, a fortified area where they started to do trading with what we now call the First Nations people. And then they, as time went on, they sort of settled a bit and, and cleared some of the wilderness. And so probably the, the ground was, was, um, was broken by people from the Hudson's Bay Trading Company. Um, and, uh, but he was the first incoming farmer. He was the first generation, uh, and, and there were others. Uh, I've got a whole, you know, I've got, I've got a chart that I found in an archive in Canada which shows me the names of all the other people who bought the plots in the Hudson's Bay Trading Company, and again, there's an Irishman and a, several Scots and whatever. Because it uh, must have had a very strong sort of resonance of such a totally black world. Yes, yeah. Yes, I, yes, I'm, it's... Um, uh, it's astonishing, really, how f how fast Canada has developed, really, because it's um, it's almost almost within living memory some of these uh, these very early settlements. I don't know whether you've read um, a book by uh, it's a fiction book by a, an author called Patrick Gale, who um, ex who found a grandfather who uh, left England under a cloud and went to Canada. And that, again, tells you a lot about how you sort of bid for these plots of land. And then you, if you actually worked them successfully, you were allowed to, to keep them. So it wasn't a case of large amounts of money uh, changing hands. It was relatively small amounts of money, but you had to work and work. And then you could claim the property as your own. So. Jesse married George Underwood. Yeah. Okay. So, and he, he was obviously prosperous. Yeah. And he died at 91. And then she, or did she? No, die? no, she died in her 90s. He died in his late 70s. I mean, he was quite old by yes. the time she came to work as a housekeeper. Yes. 
and uh, and so they weren't married very long. And the child, it, it, the Canadian authorities d determined, was definitely not the farmer's because she came to the area with uh, a small boy. And uh, I've got a letter. Um, I've got a copy of a letter from the Canadian Archive, um, the official Canadian Archive, uh, when they first, in the 1990s, were trying to trace the background of this little boy. Um, they had a woman, an old woman, write to them and say, uh, oh, well, I remember they came to the area when, you know, and he was a little boy and whatever. Um, I don't think they did DNA testing. You would nowadays. Um, Well, I might say that, <clears throat> again, you know, it might have been a community that thought that the men needed headstones and the women were either inscribed with their husband's name or maybe because... And, as my book shows, I surmise there are some clues to suggest that she was a bit of an outsider. She was... I think she was not fully accepted. Um, so, no, there's no, but I'm, I'm, I am going to put a plaque on her grave. It's one of the things I'm, uh, I'm going to do to, um, with the inheritance I got, you know. It wasn't a vast amount of money, incidentally, but it was, um, it was a sort of nice to have summer money. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Well, yes. I mean, the, the, the burial plot uh, was purchased uh, just before uh, uh, George Underwood died, and it was p purchased by... It, it, it doesn't say exactly who, who purchased it, but it was purchased for three... It was a plot for three bodies, as it were. Mm -hmm. So it was envisaged that it would be for, for him, his widow, and the little boy. Um, so, who, who knows? I mean, it was very, I found it very sad, but there you go. So, so mm. do you know how long she'd been in Canada before she went to work for her? Yes, I mean, she arrives in 1912. Yeah. Um, she, uh, she goes to work f uh, as a domestic servant, which is obviously what she was at, in, in a place called New Westminster, which is, at the time, was a a sort of bigger place than Vancouver, but it's now a suburb of Vancouver. So she went immediately to the... So she went immediately, got a job, place. she got a job, and um, then there's a gap. So she, I found her in sort of 1913. In 1915, there's someone who may well be her who's in Vancouver. Um, by this time, she has the boy... But I say he doesn't have any birth certificate, so you know, he appears to have been born in New Westminster. She appears to have moved to Vancouver, and then there's another gap, and then she turns up around 1919 um, as a housekeeper for this farmer, for this elderly farmer. So, um, and then she's in that Langley area. Uh, between the first, the first house, the farm, and the farm, she um, leaves not long after the farmer dies, and then she moves to the the shack, and she's there. Um, she, she's on that property. It changes, of course, as the years go on, but she's on that plot until she dies. So from nine, she's. She purchased it in 1922, and she dies in 1970. So she's there for nearly 50 years. Mm -hmm. So actually, much more of her life, she had 35 years in England, and apart from about two years in London, she was in Cambridge, and then 58 years in Canada. So a long, Long life. Of course, it's a one-way ticket to go to Canada. You know, people didn't have the money to just say, oh, I can fly back, you know. Uh, it, 
it was irrevocable, really, once but, you'd gone. Sorry, if I'm yeah. May. No, I'm. But, but, but this organisation, Girls Friendly Society. That, yeah. yeah. I mean, the Iona would have probably landed in Halifax or gone down to St Lawrence, and that's East Coast. But she yeah. landed three thousand yeah. miles well, the, away. Yeah. Yeah. So they they, they, they get they she books um, through the Girls Friendly Society help them with their travel arrangements. So she probably had pre-booked not only the um, the steamship, <laughs> which, as you say, goes to the <coughs> east coast. In her case, she went to the port of Quebec. Okay. But they then the Canadian Pacific Railway uh, goes right the way across Canada, and it takes a week to get there. Um, and again, you sort of think to yourself, why didn't she just stop yeah, where she was in Quebec? Yeah. I don't know. She obviously decided she wanted to go as far as possible. Maybe, I mean, I, again, all these surmises, I think. I, maybe she thought New Westminster, where she was her first destiny, sounded, well, that sounds very English, doesn't it? Sounds very comfortable, you know. Yeah, <laughs> I could tell, you know, um, it, I mean, that's the thing about when you start doing family history research, when you start, you don't know where it's going to end up, and it, it's, not, it's not like it is on the telly where there's somebody coming to you and bringing you, oh, well, now we've found this person, now, you know, you have to do the work, and there's lots of lovely, helpful people who, who do that here and in Canada, and, um, and so... Uh, once you start, you always keep the door open to more, more things to, you know, learning more things and more research. So maybe I'll find more about her time in Langley. Maybe you'll help me find more things in Langley. And, um, and also, I say, if any of you have got old family albums, do come and look at these photos. So um, just to summarise, I have got the book on sale as well. Um, it's... When I look, Amazon's always changing the price, but it's today I checked it's nine pounds seventy-five. You can order it from any bookshop, but they will charge you nine ninety-nine. So it's nine pounds tonight. So uh, and that's that's it. That's it. And um, there I am. Thank you. So finally.